If there was a scripture that I believe could best complement or be the core focus of this whole Trap House series, I believe it would live in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12. You don't have to turn there. It's going to be on the screen for you. I believe this is most likely the nucleus for our whole Trap House series. It states, we do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. The reason we're doing this series as our second sermon series of the 2023 calendar year is because God is saying, I want you to experience my promises. Every door that you're supposed to walk into, I want you to experience it. Every opportunity that I have for you, I want you to experience it. But don't just say the good stuff, also the harder stuff. Every wilderness, see that? Every wilderness that I have for you, I want you to experience it and trust me in it. Because if you're in a wilderness, it's because you're heading to a promise. You don't experience the promised land without a wilderness season. And the qualities that you're going to need right here in this text, it tells us patience and faith. Now, some of us are like, I got the faith. I'm good. I believe that God is going to do everything that he said he's going to do. I have the faith, but you don't have the patience. You don't have the patience to wash Judah's feet too. You don't have the patience to ignore criticism. You don't have the patience to not clap back when they come at you some type of way. You got the faith, but you don't have the patience. And then others of us are like, okay, I have the patience, but I don't have the radical faith. Everybody wants the miraculous, but we don't understand the requirement for the, for the miraculous is radical faith. Now, if I was a note taker, I would write this down. What is radical faith? Radical faith is when failure is 100% guaranteed if God doesn't intervene. That part. Some of us have safe faith and casual faith, but radical faith is when failure is 100% guaranteed if God doesn't intervene. I give you Bible all day. It is 100% guaranteed, Peter, when you step out the boat, you're going under the water if God doesn't intervene. It is 100% guaranteed, Daniel, when you're thrown into a lion's den that they're going to rip you to shreds if God doesn't intervene. It is 100% guaranteed, Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro, that when they throw you, somebody caught it, <laughs> when they throw you in the fiery furnace, you're going to burn up if God doesn't intervene. Everybody who wants a miracle like that, the question now is, do you have faith like that? Do you have faith like that? There's several passages of Scripture, several passages of Scripture that are going to be our foundational text, and we're going to exegete them as we go throughout this sermonic journey on this afternoon. I'm going to give them to you quickly, and then we're going to read them. Our first foundational Scripture is Mark chapter 5, verse 22. Then we're going to go to John chapter 11, verse 3. Then Mark... Chapter 6, verse 5, verse 45, and then we're going to end at Mark chapter 10, verse 32. That's so you can write it down because I'm going to read them, and as the sermon continues to go on, we're going to exegete them. Mark chapter 5, verse 22, it says, Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus ran with him. Say it again because nobody caught it. So Jesus ran with him. So Jesus ran with him. So Jesus went with him. And a large crowd followed and pressed around him. It's going to be hard for you to rush when a crowd is around you. I want you to notice the pace of our pace setter. 
John chapter 11, verse 3. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for the glory of God so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he ran to him. So he ran to him. He stayed where he was two more days. Did y'all catch that? Jesus loved them, so he stayed where he was at. Notice the pace of our pace setter. Mark chapter 6, verse 45. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and head across the lake to Bethsaida while he sent the people home. After telling everyone goodbye, he went up to a hill by himself to pray. Late that night, the disciples were in the boat in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on the land. Look at this, y'all. He saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard, struggling against the waves and wind about 3 o'clock in the morning. I had a problem with that because I'm like, if you're at the hill... And you see they're in serious trouble. They're straining hard against the wind, but you don't show up to 3 o'clock. <laughs> I want you to notice the pace of our pace setter. Mark chapter 10, verse 32, our, fin our final foundational text. says, now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus was going before them. And Jesus was going before them. And Jesus was going before them. And they were amazed as they followed. They were afraid. Don't miss this. Due to the place and the pace of Jesus, they were amazed and afraid. Everywhere else in the text, we see Jesus taking his time. But in Mark chapter 10, we see Jesus is going at a pace where it's ahead of his disciples and they're amazed due to his pace and the place. I want to speak around this thought from this subject for part six of our Trap House series, Stop Rushing Me. Stop Rushing Me. Can I get you to find at least two people around you and tell them, stop rushing this? Make sure that this is kind of high pitch. Stop rushing this. Stop. Stop rushing this. Father, you're awesome. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for this time. Thank you for the worship that has gone forth, which is the red carpet, saying be magnified and glorified. Breathe Holy Spirit on our encounter. Eternal King, would you remind us that you have an appointed time. All of this study means nothing if you are magnified, if you aren't glorified. I'm asking you, just like I did privately, I'm asking publicly. Use me as your oracle, the soundtrack, the PA system of heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody who agrees with that prayer will just shout in the room and in the overflow, amen. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, my wife and I, Lord willing, are just a few days away from the arrival of our third child, Josiah Zion Flowers. Just a few days away, and in this particular phase of the pregnancy, this particular trimester, this time frame that Tanisha is in during this pregnancy, I've noticed that her walk is different. She doesn't walk the same way she used to six months ago. She doesn't even walk the same way she used to five months ago, yet alone. She doesn't even walk the same way she used to two months ago. And it's not due to legalism. It's not due to anxiety or trauma. Nor is it due to her thinking that she's better than anybody else. She's walking different due to what she's carrying. Somebody's catching it. She's walking different due to what is on the inside of her. And as the months have gone by, as I've been an attentive and observant husband for the purpose of supporting what she carries, 
Because sidebar, true friendship, true brotherhood, true sisterhood, whenever God sends someone to you, true love will always support what God has called for you to carry. See, this is a whole word in itself because if you don't know what you're carrying, you won't be able to identify who can assist you in your new walk. Did y'all hear what I just said? And I know some people like, Pastor, you don't understand. Just these women today, <laughs> these 2023 20, women, and then my sisters are like, you don't understand. These men on today, like the dating scene in 2023 is just ghetto. <laughs> it's just ghetto. And I'm like, okay, that may not totally be incorrect, but it is incomplete. Because whoever God sends will always assist your new walk. Could it be possible the reason you keep attracting the people you attract is because your walk isn't new? See, oh, y'all got quiet. Keep my foot on the gas. Could it be the reason you're attracting and going in the same places is because your walk isn't new? Your talk isn't new. Your cravings aren't new. Your freak isn't new. Your passions aren't new. What you desire isn't new. It's the same. If you could look back, if the 2023 version of you could look back at the 2019 version of you and you can't see that your walk is different, the years have changed, but you haven't. I want to help us, family. Please hear me. It's one thing to end something that's unhealthy. It's another thing to end the version of yourself that's unhealthy. See, because if you end the thing that's unhealthy, but you yourself haven't ended the version of you that's unhealthy, you would just entertain something else that's unhealthy just with a different name. See, please hear me. Deliverance is not just stopping the activity. It's when God shows you how it keeps starting. Did y'all hear me? Deliverance is not just stopping the activity. It's when God shows you why it keeps starting. See, stopping it is clipping the twigs. Ending it is digging up the roots. Does this make sense? And far be it from us to want twig makeovers when God wants root transformation. Your discernment, hear me, your discernment is sharpened when your walk has adjusted to what you carry. It's easier for me to identify who is assisting my new walk versus who is distracting my new walk when I actually have a new walk. been observant and attentive, studying my wife so that I may support what it is that she's carrying. And I believe the Holy Spirit has customized this message. And he is using this compare and contrast metaphor to remind all of us, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, if you claim to be one who is Christ-like, if you claim to be a Christian, you're pregnant. <laughs> One more time so you can sink in. If you claim to be a Christian, if you claim to follow Jesus, you're pregnant. You're carrying the kingdom of heaven on the inside of you. You're pregnant. You're carrying vision on the inside of you. You're pregnant. You're carrying worship on the inside of you. You're pregnant. You're carrying praise on the inside of you. You're pregnant. You're carrying gratitude on the inside of you. You're pregnant. No wonder so many people have a hard time trying to identify if we're truly Christians or not. It's because with our lips, we say we're Christians, but with our life, they can't tell you pregnant. And all things being equal, a pregnant woman can't hide it too long. You can say, what if she's a healthy size? Her appetite's still going to change. All things being equal, you can't hide when you're carrying the Holy Spirit too long. All things being equal, you can't hide your worship life too long. 
So the problem is, do your lips match your walk? <laughs> do your lips match your walk? Because it should be obvious you're carrying something. Or do my lips contradict my walk? Like, does my post contradict my text? Oh, I'm about to come for your text messages. If there was some way and somehow we could see your frequently used emojis and your predictive text, would it show that your secret life and your public walk don't match? Why does all your frequently used emojis, why is it an eggplant? Why is it a peach? Okay, y'all don't want to talk to me. Y'all don't want to talk to me. Why is it a donut? My generation requires real. I'm not sorry. <laughs> A donut, a peach, what are you? Don't worry about it. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Those who freak one deep, they know. <laughs> Is there a contradiction between our lips and our walk to where we have mixed signals? This is how we experience heaven in one area of our lives, and we're experiencing hell in another area. So, like, in your bank account, you good. But your peace department is in torment. And like in your business, you good. But the way you think is in torment. You're good with giving people your gift. But your anxiety is robbing you of you, your, your impact for God's glory. Heaven, one area. Hell, in another area. And how the enemy loves to get us to be a people who swim in the swamp of lukewarm. I'm cool with you claiming Jesus in public. Just let me have you in private. I'm doing this series because I want us to mature. I want us to mature to such a degree where we could discern a trap. See, maturity has nothing to do with you getting older. Because you could be an old, gray-haired, immature, immature fool. I haven't let my lip hang in a while. I'm going to say it again. A fool. But rather, maturity is the ability to outgrow what used to fit. It's so good. What Tanisha was able to wear in September of 2022 she cannot wear in april of 2023 because something on the inside is maturing and it's maturing on the inside to such a degree where her outside has to accommodate what's maturing on the inside you can hear what i'm saying it's what's happening on the inside that's causing for the outside to accommodate all of this is filled with preaching potential but that's not even my point my main point is not only has my bride's walk adjusted to what she's carrying, but her speed has changed too. Hear me, hear me. Because it's dangerous for you to be pregnant and speed. It's dangerous for you to be pregnant and rush. It's dangerous when God has something on the inside of you that he needs you to give birth to and you keep on rushing with choices and rushing with decisions. In fact, every time we go to the doctor for all of our appointments, you know what I keep hearing the nurses tell all of their pregnant patients? You know what I keep hearing all of the OBGYNs tell their pregnant patients? Sometimes they'll even grab them by the hand and say, slow down, I don't want you to fall. And I just feel as though God has anointed me in this moment to be a spiritual OBGYN. And I want to walk you through this sermon because I don't want you to fall for a counterfeit, for a trap. For deception, for what's not God's will, for a spiritual ambush playing dress up. I don't want you to fall, so slow down. I don't want you to fall. This is a prophetic confirmation 
for many of us under the sound of my voice and watching online. God is telling you what he's trying to get us to understand on today is stop rushing me. I heard your prayers and I'm working on it. But most importantly, I'm working on you. Stop rushing me. Stop rushing me. I heard your petitions. And if it be my will, I'm going to carry it out. But more importantly than your petition, I'm trying to build you because right now you don't have the character to maintain it. You don't have the discipline to maintain it. You don't have the honesty to maintain it. You don't have the self-control to maintain it. I would be a bad father if I answered your prayer right now. Talk, Holy Spirit. I would be a bad father if I were to give it to you right now. See, please understand this. God must build the builder before the builder can ever build. One more time. God must build the builder before the builder can ever build. A lot of our prayers are asking God to build something. And God's answer to you is, right now I'm building you. That's it. I'm building you right now. If, if there was some way for me to compact what most of our prayers sound like, this is what I believe most of our prayers sound like. God, get to the good part. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? Most of us, if we be honest, this is what our prayers sound like. God, skip this, get to the good part. Get to the married part of my life. Get to the business thriving part of my life. Get to the ministry as overflowing part of my life. Skip this. Get to the good part. Unfortunately, God is not like YouTube. You can't skip and get to the part that you desire to get to. Get to the good part. I'm trying to get us to understand. You don't get to the good part without trusting God in the bad parts. Stop rushing me. Stop rushing me. Stop rushing me. You don't get the wisdom without first going through the unlearning. Stop rushing me. Stop rushing me. You don't get the healing without first going through the forgiveness. Forgiveness of what they did and the forgiveness of yourself. Some of us, you have to forgive you. You don't get to the purity without going through the withdrawals. This is so good, y'all. Can I mess y'all up? Nobody said nothing. Can I mess y'all up? All rushing is, is a death wish to peace. Ooh, I'm about to give y'all a bar. Y'all ready for this? Here it is. All rushing is, is a death wish to peace. Maybe that's why we call it a deadline. So good, y'all. It's, it's a death wish to your peace. You want to kill your peace? Rush. Rushing will cause for you to need therapy for four more years. Over the very thing that God has already healed you from, rushing will cause for you to need healing over the same exact thing. Rushing. 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 Stop rushing me. Please hear me, church family. It is better... For you to arrive at your destination at a slower pace than for you to rush and get there exhausted. It is better for you to slow down and arrive before your Goliath refreshed than for you to rush and stand before your Goliath exhausted. Many of us are losing fights that you would have the strength to beat if you wouldn't have ran. Many of us are losing fights that you would have been able to win if you weren't rushing. But since you're going at a pace that keeps your spirit so exhausted, the things that are easy for you to defeat, you're losing to. Rushing, rushing, rushing. And see, here's the thing. This is the perspective that God was giving me during study. I don't want you to rush because this is restoration you wouldn't even have to go through. 
That's one side of it. The second side of it is rushing causes for you to go in life wrecking speed. Did y'all hear me? Rushing causes for you to go at life wrecking speed. So not only do you have to recover, but everybody you crashed into has to recover too. I want to drive this home. Say if like there's a minister who engages in infidelity. Yes, once he repents or she repents, God will forgive them and he will restore him or her. But I also have to restore all of the hearts that were broken from you falling into that trap. So if it be possible, I'd rather restore you individually than for you to go into a trap and now I have to restore everybody collectively. Is this making sense? So I need you to slow down so that you won't just hit hearts. You're not just hitting walls, you're hitting hearts. So slow down, stop rushing me. But I get it. It's, it's this culture's obsession with instant. It's our obsession with instant. Think about it. Instagram. Instacart. Instamart. Instapick. Insta oatmeal. It's like this, our culture. <laughs> we love instant. But our obsession with instant is strangling our discernment, which, which is making us go at a speed where we can't avoid traps. It's our obsession, our obsession with instant, is strangling our discernment, which is causing for us to go at a speed where you can't avoid traps. You hit it because you're going too fast. Many of us, you wouldn't have gotten in some wrecks that you got in if you actually were going the speed limit. The only reason you hit that pothole is because you are distracted or driving too fast. What are you blaming God for when it's you, when it's us that's going at life wrecking speeds? We have to unpack this because many of us can't discern urges from callings. I have to teach today, y'all. We think our urge is our call. We can't discern urges from callings. Calling, a calling is a ringing that God has placed in your soul that you won't have peace until you answer it. That's a calling. You trying to enjoy the club. But you can't because there's something ringing in your soul. You went with your girlfriends to happy hour. But you really couldn't enjoy it because there's something that was ringing in your soul. You don't even enjoy the sex anymore. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But some of us have been having sex and crying during the sex. And it's not because it's good. It's because that ringing in your soul is bothering you to where you can't enjoy it. You hit up your boys and y'all get high together, but you don't enjoy it. That high isn't hitting like it used to, huh? Mm. That buzz isn't hitting like it used to. It's because there's a ringing in your soul. Hear me, you can't enjoy it like them because you're called out. And I'm talking to somebody, you're trying to enjoy it, but you can't. Because you can't enjoy it like them when you're called called is when God has put a ringing in your soul and you won't have peace until you answer it. A calling is God's will for your life and this is why you have been born to answer a problem so that when you and I die certain problems won't exist anymore because you answered that problem that's the call but a urge comes from the word urgent and the lie of anxiety is it tells you everything is urgent. Hurry up, hurry up. Hurry is the shadow of recovery. You want to live in recovery? Live in a hurry. This is so good, y'all. The lie of anxiety is it tell you everything is urgent. Haste mentalities. Hear me. Haste mentalities are the reproductive system for prolonged seasons. They produce you staying in places longer than you're supposed to. 
When everything is a rush and everything is in haste and I got to do this and I got to do that. And I get it because the culture traffics in speed. Please hear me. If I was a note taker, I'd write this down. This is about to be powerful. Culture traffics in speed. But God traffics in steps. Culture traffics in speed. But God traffics in steps. If I were to give you an acronym for steps, it would be strategies to establish produce seasonally. That's, that's a step. This is a strategy to establish produce seasonally. Do you have Bible to corroborate your claim? I do. I'm glad you asked. Psalms chapter 1, verse 3. He shall be like a tree that is planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. When I follow the steps of God, I will produce fruit in every season. It's a strategy. Your workout partner who's holding you accountable, they give you steps. What is that? That is a strategy to establish produce seasonally. We are not called to live life barren. We should live life producing something. Oh, the trap. The trap, the trick right at pivots that has been causing for many of us to be tripped up emotionally, physically, financially, and spiritually is the trap of rushing. Get to the good part. Just get to the point. That's going to be problematic for every husband. If when you talk to your wife, you have this posture. Get to the point. <laughs> Don't do what Jerry did in 2012. When Tanisha would talk, I would do this. While she's talking, I would do this. I say, just land the plane, baby. What's the point? Okay, first of all, if you're going to ask me how my day was, give me the right and give me the respect to, to, to have me tell you how my day was. Don't do this. That's disrespect. I had to learn. <laughs> Giving you wisdom. Wisdom is scholarship off of somebody else's experience. Don't do this. That's free. <laughs> Strategies. Because God knows it's better to prepare you than repair you. Gosh, I'm trying to help us, y'all. It's better to prepare you then repair you. Because remember, God must build the builder before the builder can build. So I want to push this even harder where we could understand this. We, we made this chart for you to see. If you could put this chart of steps on the screen. You could take a picture of it, watch it online, screenshot, whatever it is. I really do believe that these steps are what God has given me to give to you because this is the process that God gives us steps. And here's the thing. After he gives you the steps, you repeat it again in another, in another season. And you will repeat it again in another season. Steps, strategies to establish produce seasonally. The first step that God gives in your life is interruption. Somebody say interruption. It's when you are writing your story and God says, nope, I got something else. <laughs> it's almost like you are writing this. My mama will pay for it. Um, you're writing a story and like, God, this is what I want. It's like, nope. Nope. Somebody else, I wanted that copy. I'm going to pay for it. <laughs> you're writing your plans and God's like, nope, that's not my will either. Interruption. This happened to me. I went to college, pre-med major. He said, mm, no, you're going to be a pastor. Uh, let's do communications, psychology, and then go to seminary. I don't ever want to be a pastor. I'm, I'm going to just be a doctor. No, you're going to be a pastor. <laughs> now, the thing is, how many of us are crying to God over these? How many of us are crying over 
what we wanted. Bible, all day. Moses at the burning bush, what is that? Interruption. The disciples washing their nets and Jesus coming along and saying, follow me. What is that? Interruption. David in the pasture, minding his business. King uh, Prophet Solomon, Prophet um, Samuel coming, pouring oil on him and telling him you're going to be the king while he is a shepherd. What did he just do? Interruption. So why are we complaining about the first step that God gives you? Interruption. Now, after interruption is introduction. Whom shall I say sent me? I am that I am. I have to introduce myself to you. Many of us, that's where we're at right now. I'm trying to get you to get I'm Jehovah Jireh. Your anxiety is so high because you think your job is your provider. I want to introduce you to I am Jehovah Jireh, your provider. Get that. Because if you could understand that's who I am, you'll stop having anxiety over resources. Yeah. Got to introduce myself to you. Then after he gives you an introduction, now he gives you instruction. Now, this is my problem with the church. My problem with many churches is we want people to follow instructions who had no interruption. You should live holy. You're giving them instructions. They've had no interruption nor introduction. They have to meet him first before they ever follow his instruction. Why are you dressed like that? You're not, that's instruction. They haven't had an introduction. After he gives you instruction, look, hey, you want to be fishers of men? I've interrupted your life. I'm introducing myself. Follow me. Instructions. First series of this year, planted. What was that? Instructions. Because the next step is construction. Now I got to build you. I have to build in you grace. You still holding a grudge against your mother? Could you imagine how many records I got on you? You're not talking to them because of what they said and what they did. Did you not forget what you said and what you did to me? I, I need you to practice grace. So I got to build that in. I have to construct. And the beauty of the construction season, that's usually your wilderness season. And that's love. You know why? Because it's like, I don't want you to produce pain. So I'm going to have you in a season where I construct you so that when you get to the last step of production, it's biblical, not traumatic. This is so good, y'all. Production. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's production. Make disciples. And then you know what? It repeats. Have a whole another season, God will interrupt you. Okay, you knew me as Jehovah Jireh. <laughs> now I need you to know me as Elohim. I am that I am. See, one season you might need me to be your provider. The next season you might need me to be your way maker. The next season you might need me to be the one that delivers you from a fiery furnace. You don't know what I am you're going to need for me to be, so just trust my steps. Let me give you a Bible. Psalms 37, verse 23, it says, The Lord makes firm the what's that word steps of the one who delights in him proverbs 16 verse 9 in their hearts humans plan their course but the lord establishes <laughs> strategies to establish produce seasonally but the lord establishes what their steps that's our obsession with instant that's strangling our discernment. That's having us go at speeds where we can't avoid traps. Can I get everybody to say this in the room? Everybody watching online, put this in the room in all caps. Can I get us to say, Father, Father help, me to trust help me to trust your timing, your timing. instead of my efforts. Of my efforts. Order, my steps, Order my steps and set my pace. Set my pace. One more time, Father, Father 
Help me to trust your timing instead of my efforts. Order my steps and set my pace. Stop rushing me. Stop rushing me. In our foundational text, we see Jairus came and told Jesus, my daughter is about to die. Jesus doesn't run. He takes his time. We know that he's taking his time because when somebody touched him, the woman with the issue of blood, when they touched his cloak, he stopped. Turned around talking about, who touched me? If I was Jairus, I would say, with all due respect, who cares? My daughter is dying. But Jesus was in no hurry to get to Jairus' house. What if I were to tell you your emergency is not God's emergency? I know. I know. Because remember, introduction. He wanted Jesus to be a healer. Jesus says, no, I'm going to be a resurrector. Y'all miss what I just said. You want me to be a healer. I'm going to go slow on purpose to introduce I'm not just a healer, bro. I'm also the resurrection. That's Mark chapter 5. I want you to notice the pace of our pace setter. John chapter 11, the sisters sent word to Jesus, the one whom you love is sick. And the text, verse 5 and 6 says, now Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus, so he stayed two more days. Let me mess you up. God loves you so much that sometimes he doesn't come when you ask him to. Am I reading the Bible? That's what the text says. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus, so when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. I love you so much, I'm not going to come when you ask me to. I want you to notice the pace of our pace setter. Mark chapter 6, this was kind of funny to me. I I want you to look at verse 48. I want you to look at verse 48. Verse 48 in Mark chapter 6, it says, When he saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and waves, about 3 o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. He intended to go past them. (laughs) What? So I'm like, okay, you saw us in trouble. You saw us rowing. And you didn't run. Now me, when it rains in Houston and it's windy, I'm kind of like trying to get out of the rain. Jesus is walking on turbulence. Catch this, y'all. His walk caught up to their struggle. (laughs) I believe the Holy Spirit is trying to give us a perspective. With me, I can get you there faster than your grind can. I'm walking. On the you struggling, you straining, you trying. He's like, I'm passing y'all up. And I'm walking. Notice the pace. And I'm like, man, why? Why? Why would you get ready to? Passed them up. And there's two perspectives that I want you to consider. Could it be, I just want you to see I'm with you. In your storm, I'm here. That hard divorce, I'm here. That pandemic, I'm here. How do you know? Because the text says in verse 50, do not be afraid. He said, take courage. I am here. Have you thought God forgot about you? What if he puts himself in a vicinity close enough where he can remind you, it looks bad, but I'm right here. And I'm like, okay, you are going to walk past though. And so then they cried out, it's a ghost. What if they wouldn't have cried? What are you struggling with alone because you're not crying out? I'm cool. I could take it. Stop measuring your strength by how much you could take. 
Notice the pace of our pace setter. And this is where we park the aircraft of this sermon and get ready to go towards the terminal and end. Look at verse, look at Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter, Mark chapter 10, verse 32. It says, now when they were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was going before them and they were amazed as they followed, they were afraid. Every other place. Please don't miss this. Every other place. It's like Jesus is taking his time. But to Jerusalem, Jesus is walking ahead of them. And as I look at the text, his pace had to shock them because the very next verse, in the, in the verse it says they were amazed and afraid. Why? Because he's going to Jerusalem. He turns around and tells them, hey, we going to Jerusalem. They're going to betray the Son of Man. They're going to beat me. They're going to spit on me. I'm going to get crucified. I'm going to die. And I'm going to raise on the third day. Let's go. <laughs> the time where you see Jesus having an ex uh, accelerated pace is when he's heading to the cross. Yeah. Everything else, I'll stop if you touch me. I'm walking on water. But when it's time to die, he has a face like flint. I'm focused. And the question I want to ask you is, what would our life look like if our pace was elevated for every time our flesh needed to, every time our flesh needed to die? Every time our flesh needed to be put on the cross, that's when you walk faster. Every time you need to crush your pride, that's when you walk faster. Every time you need to crush your, your lust, that's when you walk faster. He's focused on redeeming mankind and his pace is ahead of the disciples to where they're amazed and afraid they just tried to kill you no man takes my life I lay my life down and if I lay my life down I'm gonna pick it up again let's go I'm focused heading towards the cross your issues, I'll take my time. But God issues, I'm on a mission. And I have a face like Flint. And the place that God wants us to get us to, you only accelerate your pace when it's for his glory and killing your flesh. This is powerful, y'all. I, I just, I want you to consider people who rush, they, they do these five things. People who live on rush. They do this. Number one, they forget commitments. Your, your edges are coming right now, okay? <laughs> they, they, they forget commitments because it's hard to live in haste and have organized mental pace. You're rushing. You forget. Number two, people who live in rushing over talk you and interrupt you when you talk. Notice when you talk to somebody, do they interrupt you a lot? Do they over talk you? These are people who live in a rush. How could you say that? The Bible says be slow to speak. Just a little advice. Notice, do they constantly interrupt? This means I don't have a pattern of respecting things to finish. I live... On rushing. Ooh, y'all should see y'all faces. <laughs> Number three, people who live in rushing get upset at laws and boundaries decide, designed to protect. You get upset at everybody who does the speed limit. <laughs> no judgment. It frustrates you. When you let them get in front of you and they go the speed limit. If I would have known you would have gone 45, I wouldn't have let you in front of me. I can't stand laws. I can't stand counseling. I can't, I can't stand discipleship. I can't stand accountability. Anything designed to protect me, I can't stand it. It's people who live in a rush. We going to get married this year. I don't care if you see any signs. See, here's the thing about rushing. Rushing causes for you to see every red flag God shows you in a blur. You can't even hear God because you're moving so fast. God's like, that's not my will. <laughs> don't go there. You just fast. 
pastor, I just can't hear what God's saying. That's not my way. You just can't hear it. Fast. <laughs> Somebody shout rushing. rushing. Number four, people who live in rushing, they're in a rush to self-justification. Slow to apologize, quick to defend. They're rushed to justify. Well, if you wouldn't have, I know you're not talking. That statement. Rush to justification. Last one, people who live in rushing dwell in chaos. Can't have order when you live in a rush. I, I want you to consider something. In Genesis 21, when the Lord says, this is verse 1, the Lord gracious, graciously remembered and visited Sarah as he said, and the Lord did for her as he promised. So Sarah conceived and gave birth for a son, for a son, Abraham, in his old age, at the appointed time which God had spoken. Somebody say appointed time. Okay, Exodus chapter 9, verse 5, the Lord appointed a set time. Somebody say set time. Okay, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. Songs of Solomon chapter 8 verse 4, oh let me warn you sisters in Jerusalem, don't excite love, don't stir it up until the time is right and you're ready. If the Bible keeps saying appointed time, this must mean my, by default there is a such time as premature. If the Bible keeps saying a set time, this must mean there is a time when you're not ready. Hmm. You're, you're, you're not wrong. I wonder who is frustrated with God right now. Because he's not, a, he's not squeezing you in before your appointed time. Let me make it make sense. He's not squeezing you in before your appointment. You ever gone to an appointment early thinking because you got there early they could squeeze you in? We do that to God. So how do we stop rushing? Number one, establish a marathon pace. Establish a marathon pace. Because many of us, it's like, if we move too fast, we'll break things. If we move too slow, we'll miss things. But then if we don't move at all, we'll waste our life. So God said, I need you to let me establish a marathon pace. This is not a sprint. It's a marathon. Number two, what God builds in you is more important than getting there. Whatever your there is, everybody's there in here is different. What is building in you? Your call is to get you pointed in the right direction. The process is to get you thinking in the right direction. Number three, God moves gradually, then suddenly. So good, y'all. I'm going to only give you one verse. I have a whole lot, but I'm out of time. One verse, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow. I could just stop right there. <laughs> the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God moves gradually, then suddenly. Number four, hell has a trap specifically for the impatient. You will fall into the trap easy if you're an impatient person. And last point, we'll pray and go home. Even if you rush and it's not the appointed time, you'll still have to wait. Thank you for the one golf clap. <laughs> Put it back up, Carl. Put it back up. Four or five. Four or five. Four or five. This right here. Hell has traps specifically for the impatient. And even if you rush, if it's not the appointed time, you're still going to have to wait. I'm 
still have to wait. So I wanted to really warn us today. Warn us and also encourage us. There's steps that God has. I promise you, those steps, if you look at your life, you'll see it does go in that pattern. I don't want you to fall. Slow down. Father, forgive us for trying to control the outcome. That's all this is. Forgive us for thinking that we're the author of our lives. And I pray, God, that you will help us to become individuals who are in sync with your pace. And I pray specifically for those who have trust issues that started with people and now that is being projected on you. Help us to remember, like in the text we just read, Mark chapter 6, I am here. And help us trust you more than we trust our efforts or our grind. Slow us down so that anxiety can no longer be at the will of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Were you blessed on today? Yeah.